Um, so, hello everybody. Um, so, um, let me speak about uh, my kind of motivation of why I became a um, consciousness researcher. So this uh, is a you know a square of the blue, and uh, this was one of the first um, kind of impression or uh, question that I had uh, when I was a uh, junior high school student. And uh, on the way uh, to the school, it was quite you know sunny and also very hot day. Um, one of my best friends uh, suddenly asked me about the possibility that um, whether I'm experiencing the uh, blue for him. Uh, which is uh, green for me, or vice versa. And uh, we discussed a little bit uh, about this uh, on the way and then coming back from the school as well, but uh, we never got to the point of, you know, agreement or, you know, a solution about this problem. And uh, as you may know, this is um, uh, a problem called the inverted quadria in the philosophy and some of the neuroscience of color. And, uh, uh, but uh, this... Uh, is usually a kind of the um, swivel or um, question that you may have uh, when you are a kid to see whether you know you are experiencing the you know things in the same way as other people or not. And then uh, sometimes uh, you may have a uh, chance to check whether this is actually the case or not, like you know uh, synesthesia or other kind of you know experiential kind of atypicalness. But uh, many people forget about this kind of. Uh, fundamental question, as this is not an uh, answerable question in empirical science, or so told uh, by many of the co colleagues or teachers, right? But uh, um, this somehow um, instilled me, and uh, uh, led me to kind of, you know, led to the science of consciousness, and the, that this is one of the many of the questions that I wanted to answer or address at least in other science. That it's been long time. Uh, I've been thinking about whether it's possible to make this kind of question scientific or not, and uh, that's um, the kind of uh, the story that I want to tell to today. And my current thinking is that it's probably possible to do it in science. And uh, today, my talk uh, title is uh, "You might uh, if you have seen my talk before." Uh, it's the I use a different kind of title, but uh, there is some reason why this is the case. But uh, my talk title today is that uh, my green is not your green. And uh, I'll talk about uh, two main things for today. Um, one is a quality structure approach that I'm uh, uh, trying to promote over the last uh, couple of years. And also uh, the other one is about uh, uh, re registered report of the research. Um, if you're experimentalist in consciousness science, I think this is probably something to ponder in the school setting like you, you guys have. So the outline of the um, talk is that um, I first want to give a very brief overview about the recent trends in consciousness research and then adversarial collaboration and also register the report. And then uh, I'll talk about the Korea Structure Project and the specific application. So this is a uh, very uh, you know, selective view of the, you know, major or popular kind of view or theories of consciousness. And the uh, recent um, count seems to go uh, over 40 theories of consciousness, um, going from, you know, how the problem or illusionism or neural network space to uh, integrated information theory, recurrency, and uh, predictive coding, whatever you want. And there are lots of reviews written on the uh, Kind of meta review of the theories uh, recently by Butlin uh, on computational functionalism and the Bain and so on, uh, published like last month of this year. And uh, as a young researcher and a participant for this kind of summer school, uh, you might actually wonder what can you actually do with this kind of you know lots of theories and how much you can add uh, uh, to this kind of you know situation. And uh, my take about this is that, you know, um, you guys are, are probably in a very good um, position and uh, much, much better uh, position than, you know, um, previously, like over the last 20 years. Uh, uh, and uh, there, there are several reasons why I think that's the case. And uh, this relates to this registered report issue, but uh, um, unlike when I was a PhD student uh, 20 years ago, um, Right now, we have a mechanism for open science that 
you know, guarantees the, uh, you know, gradual, but it's very, you know, said, uh, steadily, you know, uh, improvement of the scientific environment and the learning and sharing the information. And also, uh, previously, we didn't have any kind of incentive to report a new finding. And that makes it difficult to, you know, kind of admit your fault or failure. And that's very, very bad for making progress in some science, in my opinion. And the final thing is that about the registered report. This is something that I really want to kind of, you know, uh, ask you to think about uh, if you are also a PhD student and, uh, you know, think about it. And my specific kind of, you know, um, memory during the PhD, it, uh, there, are, there are two kind of painful PhD studies I have. And uh, one of them is uh, about visual motion psychophysics of the fMRI. And um, I was a, a PhD student of uh, Christoph Koch, uh, who you might have uh, heard as a uh, sort of a uh, uh, very you know, big figure right now, uh, chief investigator for the Allen Institute, uh, chief uh, executive officer, I think, you know, it's like a CEO. And uh, uh, he's now retiring, uh, Yakim Brown, who is, uh, uh, you know, who promoted the task of the uh, dual task attention experiment and uh, guarantee he's a very famous uh, imaging person in the UCL. And under these, you know, three gigantic people, uh, my PhD started, and uh, especially for this uh, visual motion uh, paper. And uh, that one is a combination of a computational psychophysics and fMRI project, and using this kind of, you know, complex looking GABA patch uh, uh, visual motion stimuli uh, that controls both, you know, contrast and the coherence and so on. And we have a very nice hypothesis and the theory about you know doing this kind of experiment and uh, roughly speaking we our claim or hypothesis was that uh, with this kind of stimulus we should be able to manipulate or control v1 you know the primary visual cortex and mt uh motion area simultaneously in an arbitrary and uh, uh model specific predictable way Using, and then uh, we are planning to verify that claim with the fMRI. But then when we did that experiment, uh, you know, in collaboration with Garant, what we found was that uh, indeed, you know, we were able to, you know, manipulate V1 and VMT, but to our surprise and also something that we couldn't ever explain was that the collateral cortex was gigantically activated by manipulation of uh, things that we were not really intending to. And because of that, we didn't like it. And then uh, eventually, after spending like two or three years, uh, we didn't publish this uh, at all. And something similar happened for my thesis as well. Uh, I had an, you know, I, I ran probably 200 subjects or something uh, in total for peer conditioning in human, but this also didn't uh, work. Um, it, it kind of worked, but we didn't really uh, like the result and they didn't uh, publish it. But uh, in this respect, both of the st studies, you know, if we were, if I was doing this registered report, specifying in a particular clear hypothesis and the plan for the, uh, you know, sampling and also, you know, a plan for the uh, sharing of the, all these data that might have uh, promoted science really well. And I really regret that in these days. So, in uh, be, be based on this kind of you know experience, um, we have been doing uh, this uh, registered report uh, studies in the past, and one of the particular uh, issue that you may have heard in this you know, summer school, uh, the, the school is this debate about uh, whether the consciousness located in the front or back of the brain. You don't need to understand this in particular uh, kind of a debate to understand this one, but uh, there was some kind of, you know, uh, theoretical debate back and forth between two groups and then also, you know, um, further bigger kind of, you know, a, a publication followed. But before um, all these things, uh, we actually got the grant to do test this, and then we were already doing this for a long time. And uh, the idea was to utilize some particular experiment that was already published in uh, 2017 or 15, where uh, in the beginning, subjects were presented with a stimulus like, you know, this 
uh, kind of moving green dots, uh, and, uh, in the context of the, in the background of this, you know, line, uh, uh, texture, where the texture sometimes become face like or random and so on. And then sometimes uh, people, 50% of people spontaneously notice it, but 50% of the people remain unconscious. And then after asking whether you notice anything about background, 100% of people become, um, you know, um, aware of the background. And then finally, you can do some kind of test to see whether they are actually perceiving, you know, uh, things in the background form. And this is uh, called one of the no report paradigms, where if you compare this uh, without response, but becoming aware, this is a phase two stage, uh, stage. and then uh, uh, no awareness and also without response in the phase one, then you can subtract these two to see only the consciousness component, but uh, uh, less contaminated by this, you know, uh, response to the stimulus itself. And using this, uh, what we were, what we proposed for a long time ago was to do this, you know, registered report, analyzing only one subject fully, and then uh, we propose to analyze the rest of the available, potentially available uh, data after acceptance of this plan of the uh, analysis. And what we basically, uh, this is already uh, published this year, is that uh, we ask the question of uh, whether the pattern of the kind of, you know, uh, grandeur causality or causal interaction from back to the uh, front, does it uh, make a difference between whether you um, consciously see the face or not. And then uh, this was uh, basically, you know, uh, regarded as a very interesting kind of question and analysis technique based on this uh, N equal one, it's feasible and so on, and we got the approval. But it turns out that the result was completely unexpected from uh, either of the uh, theory. So, and the, the in short, uh, I mean, uh, if you are interested, um, I, I, I want you to actually take a look at this, you know, uh, published paper. But uh, in short, uh, what we found was that uh, even before anybody becomes conscious, actually, this grandeur quality from back to the front already discriminated uh, face versus non-face. And becoming conscious or be, uh, providing some response actually didn't make any difference about that. So... That's pretty difficult to explain with the currently, uh, you know, proposed uh, theories of consciousness. But because this was a registered report, we were able to publish it, and so it's gonna be, it's gonna sh uh, be something that needs to be explained in the future by the, some theories of uh, consciousness. And I think this is um, the kind of the inter important, uh, you know, no, it's not really a new finding, but. Uh, Finding that would be probably very difficult to publish if it's not a registered report. And uh, now, so what what this you know, registered report means is that you first you know start with a question, scientific question, and if you learn various kind of consciousness theories, you probably will have some kind of idea of um, the question that would be predicted in different way between the theories. And then that's already a great idea. And then if you uh, write the you know, paper based on the partial amount of the data uh, you collect in a pilot result or something like you know, what I did, you know, only analyze on that part of the data and then propose a future um, uh, full re uh, research prediction, then uh, that works basically. And this Kind of practice has been a gold standard in the medi medical uh, science, and that has uh, you know um, prompted a lot of progress in this you know me medical science, especially the uh, pregnancy and so on. And then uh, this also is a good thing for you guys, uh, you know, young researchers, to assure that this is going to be uh, publishable. I mean, uh, once the proposal is accepted in the stage one, then uh, it, no matter what kind of result you get, stage two uh, result will be accepted in by the journal. And in the future, if you start to, uh, your own lab as a young PI, it's also good, I think, in the sense that, you know, you can align grant writing proposal for what you want to do, and so preliminary data collection, and also actual science uh, in the, uh, you know, simultaneously. 
if you don't do this, what happens is that you know you post hoc edit what you found, and also you propose based on what you already know, and then you know it's just you know scientifically not really good practice in any case. So, uh, I in that sense, I, I would also you know um, strongly recommend that to the young people, and then also you know uh, I also said uh, something like uh, this and ah uh, maybe one of the Biggest important thing I want to stress uh, is that uh, by doing so, we probably will know how little about consciousness. And this is quite important in the current, you know, theories of consciousness for life relation. You know, many people pretend that, you know, they understand or explain consciousness. But when you put that kind of theory into the practice, you'll notice that how little or you know how badly each of the theories are specifying the details uh, to make any useful prediction about some kind of phenomena. And however, accepting this kind of incompleteness and uh, based on the failure, I think that consciousness research will grow much faster and also, uh, in a healthy way. And um, uh, but you might also have already done this by uh, by yourself, and then uh, may know that you know, sometimes you know it can take more time, and so require more serious thinking about statistics, and no you know post hoc explanation is allowed. So you may not be able to get much of the PI's contribution in terms of writing and the interpretation. But I think this is the way to go. So I really want to encourage this, and. Um, these are the list of the papers that we have been doing these days, and so some of them are already published. So uh, at this stage, I want to take any questions if you have uh, about this uh, part of that talk. Um, okay, uh, then let me move on to the rest of the part. Then uh, about the Korea Structure Project. So, uh, I, as I said in the beginning, uh, the question at this part uh, starts with whether it's possible to ask the question of you know whether my uh, blueness is uh, uh, same as your blueness. And uh, uh, um, traditionally, it has been said that uh, this kind of question is just impossible in the face of the science because quality or uh, quality of experience is uh, ineffable. Uh, uh, it's impossible to barbarize. And also, um, it's private. You know, it's just impossible to express it uh, and deliver it to the other people in a meaningful way. Uh, however, our uh, project, uh, funded by now uh, Japanese government for the next you know five years, is uh, um, uh, proposing that this is probably possible uh, through the structure approach. And uh, this is a list of the PIs uh, uh, involved in this project, and um, I'll just skip this. Um, but you know, um, we are kind of you know doing interdisciplinary research on this topic. And the uh, uh, key idea here is that uh, we are going to use the you know uh, new approach called the structure approach to quality, and then to uh, uh, try to address this uh, uh, qualitative aspect of the uh, quality uh, uh, using. You know, interdisciplinary way, and uh, th this is a bit of the advertisement. But uh, uh, we are going to uh, organize the summer school, uh, uh, like your you know uh, winter school over there, uh, probably once a year uh, in uh, summer or late autumn. And uh, this year's uh, lecture uh, is um, these people um, undergoing through this uh, uh, interdisciplinary project from you know math to philosophy to integrated information theory this year. And the next round of application is uh, most likely this year, to May, uh, November. And it's gonna be happening in uh, Japan. So um, maybe I'll just skip this. Uh, the w key idea of our uh, project is this, um, so based on the category theory and uh, um, Especially the inspiration from the so-called Yone Dilemma uh, in this mathematical uh, uh, field of the category theory. So uh, what it means about this uh, uh, category theory or Yone Dilemma? So um, uh, many philosophers actually has been talking that uh, rogue uh, feelings of what it is like character qualia are impossible to barbarize the characterize 
by words or sentences, but it's possible to relate to other things. For example, uh, Ned Block here, um, uh, as well as uh, this is uh, uh, Thomas Nagel, and also uh, David Chalmers, had program of consciousness. All of these people have pointed out that the qualia uh, or qualitative aspect of consciousness is essentially relational. And uh, without uh, relating to anything, uh, it's just impossible to understand or, you know, um, experience. And this Yoneda Lemma or category theory is a kind of mathematical version of this idea and uh, more precisely uh, proved in uh, category theory. So to, uh, the idea is that uh, Korea itself is difficult to describe or, you know, um, deliver to other people, right? Like, you know, in the case of the red, uh, what you can say is probably like, you know, oh, this red is similar to my, you know, uh, features, the background here, or uh, wine that I had yesterday. So this kind of metaphoric or analogical uh, relational characterization is all, all, pretty much everything that you can do. And in science, um, these um, uh, properties that are difficult to describe or define in its own, uh, so-called intrinsic property, is still possible to study. Uh, the examples are here, like meaning of the words or properties of animals or uh, black holes or infinity in math or personality. Um, these kind of things are difficult, at least, to describe in its own intrinsic characteristic, like uh, putting the property in a, uh, like a dictionary and also listing it uh, one by one. And in the case of the black hole, that is even uh, uh, really clear because you cannot directly measure the black hole itself. However, um, how the science has uh, progress of, about these, you know, things that are not difficult and not, are not easy to characterize or measure in itself is its relation or interaction with other objects. Like a black hole case is that uh, the, uh, you know, uh, cosmologists measure its interaction with the nearby, you know, uh, cosmological uh, objects and so on. And that is uh, the idea of the, um, or philosophy of the Yone Dilemma. And what it means is basically, it boils down to, if the relationship between A and B is the same to others, then A and B itself must be uh, uh, isomorphic, indistinguishable in itself. So in this case, you know, it's a, a similarity between A and the other objects, and then B and the other objects, you just collect by a bunch. And then if the similarity relationship itself are the same, then uh, A and B must be uh, the same. That's the idea. And uh, so using this kind of approach, what we think is that uh, maybe, you know, the way we are experiencing the blue would be possible to relate to other people's, you know, blueness. And uh, uh, so I'll just skip this uh, potential structure of the podium. And then now the uh, question becomes uh, empirical. So how can we obtain the quality structure through this uh, massive relationship between the uh, objects? And as a uh, feasibility kind of study, we started with the collection of the similarity ratings between the color objects. So this is a collaboration among us, uh, among uh, other you know, PI uh, in the quality structure project. And uh, the first link is uh, available here if you're interested. And um, uh, here's how the task uh, looks like. So um, this is an online experiment where we present this kind of thing to the online participants and then uh, ask uh, the center object very uh, focally and then quickly we show this uh, to the parts of the color in a random location and then ask them to uh, provide a similarity rating from zero to seven. And it looks like uh, this in uh, real time, almost real time. So. You don't know where it's going to be presented. And then after you know, orange, uh, uh, red and purple, maybe you press one, it's very similar. And then green and blue, it's very dissimilar, maybe six. And then uh, these two shades of the green that are almost identical, so it's zero and so on. So using this uh, kind of setting, we can um, efficiently collect the data from you know hundreds of people almost instantaneously between the like 93 colors in this uh, study that we uh, conducted. 
each of these entries here of this similarity matrix uh, uh, shows this uh, uh, color coding. And the seven uh, white part uh, means it's very dissimilar, and the black is the uh, most similar. So the diagonal term uh, is all black because uh, they are comparing the same, you know, color. And then the nearby colors are also uh, reported as very similar, uh, one or two and so on. And then in this case, we uh, ran over 400 people of the normal uh, uh, color experience. And from here, we can use a various kind of uh, dimensional reduction technique to visualize how this 93 color looks like in 3D, for example. And uh, I, if I have time, I can uh, go into more detail. But uh, in the case of a color, using from you know black to white and also different hues and saturation, we never obtain that uh, the color structures are 3D, like uh, you might expect from the previous uh, you know typological studies of the color would uh, predict. But this part, unfortunately, we didn't do the registered report actually. So uh, that's the kind of the color aquarium structure, one possible formulation. And then um, what we do as a next step is to uh, have an, uh, or develop a strategy to compare or characterize this structure between the people. And then if the structures are the same between the two people, then um, we can also you know, make a, a very well uh, educated guess about you know, maybe I'm seeing the green in the same way as your green and so on. So to do that, uh, what we introduce is this unsupervised uh, or unlabeled alignment between the choreo structures. So uh, usually, um, once uh, ideas of the comparison of the uh, structure between the person A and person B would be to have this kind of a label of the color. And then to see whether this you know, red corresponds to uh, red and then also uh, uh, purple corresponds to purple as well. So this is a kind of a supervised approach. And then here, it looks like the uh, shape is already different. Therefore, you know, they are not that similar or something like that. That's the kind of the conclusion that previous uh, research tended to, you know, approach. But uh, our approach is a bit different. So, Instead of you know already making or knowing which part should be matching with the other, we allow uh, the other side of the um, list of the objects to be completely blind, and then ask whether this you know red patch is corresponding to this guy or this guy or maybe you know somewhere in between the different kind of colors that the other person doesn't have, and then to minimize the overall the matching of the shape between the two kind of you know, structures. That's the basic idea. And uh, to do that, uh, we use this uh, um, metric called the gromo time optimal transportation. And um, I don't know uh, whether you are interested in this kind of detail, but uh, roughly speaking, the idea is uh, to have a uh, kind of metric or um, definition about you know the uh, dissimilarity between the object within one side and then uh, the other side as well. But uh, this doesn't have to be the same kind of you know level of the uh, you know distance. But then what you do is that uh, subtract these two and then uh, you know uh, square it and then multiply by this transportation uh, amount. So what the, it amounts to. Is that if this distance between the you know two objects are the same, then you want to maximize these guys. But if you are they are different already, then to minimize this value, you want to assign zero value to this you know, gamma uh, and so on. So eventually, what you uh, get is this optimized transportation matrix plan, which will have a bigger kind of a, a, a pile when the relationship between the one domain to the other is the same. And this kind of uh, uh, technique has been used, used in the computational uh, language, linguistic study uh, in the beginning. For example, if I have an, a you know, uh, characteristic relationship between, let's say, you know, cat and dog in English, then it's really likely that, the, uh, that that kind of relationship in other language, even for you know, Japanese, like you know, for me, inu and neko, that's a, a corresponding to the cat and dog, 
they have the similar kind of relationship between the cat and dog. So without knowing uh, which one corresponds to which level, just by knowing the relationship within each of the categories, we can already match the escape of these things. Uh, that's the idea of this uh, optimal transport. And then uh, after aligning these two shapes from you know one uh, one uh, population of the subject to the other, we can al uh, align it and then uh, eventually evaluate whether that was uh, indeed correct or not. So um, empirically, what we do is something like this. So group one of the typical participants, we split it into a hundred people and another hundred people, which looks like a bit different in terms of you know multi-dimensional scaling. And that's the reason why we don't want to use this multi-dimensional scaling on the, uh, as a, you know, a way to analyze it. But then uh, after that, we uh, sort of optimize this uh, transportation parameter and then get this uh, uh, transportation matrix. And here, the diagonal is uh, relatively high in terms of the color intensity. That means that uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, matching in terms of the uh, transportation or uh, color without really knowing the label. Then uh, after that, after knowing that we can align these two uh, by rotating this t group T1 and so on, and then to get uh, quite a good uh, matching here. And that's uh, that result in this you know, um, uh, very good matching rate between the two separate uh, typical people uh, in the color perception. And something like that can be also done within the color blind people. And by splitting a hundred and hundred, you know, uh, colored blind people, we get a uh, reasonable, you know, three, more than three dimensional, higher, uh, you know, complex uh, color uh, quality uh, structure. And then that can be also matched really well. So they have their own kind of peculiar color uh, structure. However, if you do that with, uh, between the, you know, color blind and also uh, color typical people, then uh, it turns out that uh, we can't really align it at all. So this this means that the, uh, the alignment uh, is uh, quite you know random, almost at the chance level, and there is almost no you know empirical uh, matching of the diagonal you know transportation. This up to so far is not super kind of you know uh, surprising. I mean, uh, if you already anticipate that you know color uh, uh, for Typical and uh, atypical would be different, then that's not super, you know, strange. But recently we found that that uh, by going back to the previous, you know, color blind versus color typical literature, we found that uh, there is an uh, interesting suggestion. This is just a schematic uh, of this on MDS, but uh, I don't know if you notice anything about this by looking at this, but. If you really carefully look at this, what you notice is that um, this color typical people's, uh, you know, coloring structure here and the color blind structure here is almost the same if we remove this you know, green here. So this is a yellow, gold, uh, orange, red, and this is yellow, green, uh, gold, orange, red. And then this is a purple, uh, and then uh, this is violet or something, and then blue, and then turquoise, apart from uh, violet, blue, and turquoise. All of these relations are the same, but you know, greens are located here or here. And the, in the previous study, they used only very few uh, colors, so they probably didn't have a face for that. But uh, we now have these 93 colors. So we, with this you know, power, what we tried was um, to see whether it's possible to align these, you know, color blind and the color, you know, normal people. And then it turns out that indeed, you know, we can align it if we remove the green colors of the uh, uh, color blind and so That's the recent uh, result that we found. And this means, you know, coming, coming back to this title of this thing, most likely color blind people and the color typical people are experiencing green definitely differently. But possibly other colors are experienced in a similar way. But this is uh, conjecture and uh, I don't have a strong argument to uh, make about that, uh, except for some kind of you know uh, potential future direction. 
So, uh, so first today I talked about uh, Yoneda Lemma inspired characterization, relational characterization of Quoria. And uh, I also, you know, uh, explained a little bit about quantifying uh, similarity structures among Quoria using large scale tech physics. And then uh, uh, eventually aligning um, uh, Quoria structure alignment uh, without the labels um, I uh, introduced. So uh, with that, I think right now it's 30, uh, 40, but maybe I'll just uh, give a kind of next step. So today I talked a little bit only about uh, aligning the information structures, uh, uh, for the structure between you know one group of the people to the other group. But of course, this is not uh, you know individual base. So you know we want to do this uh, in an individual base and so on. And also, uh, we want to uh, understand the relationship between the quarter structure and some kind of structure that is emerging or defined by the uh, brain. And my suspicion is that uh, it is the both connectivity plus activity state that defines this information structure. And uh, in terms of the integrated information theory, this is uh, called the cause effect structure. And other uh, theories of consciousness um, are relatively, you know, loose or kind of ambiguous about, you know, how to connect this, you know, qualia, one the qualitative aspects of the consciousness to something about the you know, brain. So I don't know much about it, but uh, uh, any kind of, you know, uh, counter proposal would be, um, you know, great. And we should do the, you know, release of the report on uh, comparing those, you know, alignments uh, between the theories uh, in the future. And then, um, if we can also translate from one brain to the other brain uh, in terms of the information structure, then eventually we should have uh, two ways to compare. You know, this way of uh, uh, quadria structure to the brain, and the brain to brain, and the brain to quadria kind of you know pathway, and this quadria to quadria comparison. And in the category theory uh, terms, I call a commutative diagram. You can go to either of the pathway to make sure uh, or address whether uh, a person, two persons are experiencing the same thing. And that's the, the kind of a thing that we, we plan to do or we hope to do um, in the next you know, few years uh, to address the question of this, you know, for it, yeah, this uh, physical substrate. Thank you for your attention.